Okay, welcome to yet another session uh, in introduction to photonics. Uh, so we started uh, the last couple of lectures trying to appreciate the science of light in terms of uh, ray optics initially. We saw some examples of how uh, ray optical principles can be used to uh, design uh, various elements like endoscopes and we are looking at what happens when light goes through a prism and so on. And uh, then we said, okay, ray optics can get us so far, but there are certain properties of light, especially when it comes to explaining the wavelength and, and uh, phase of light. Uh, we are not able to capture that using ray optics. So we went on to looking at light waves as sorry, light as uh, propagating in terms of waves. And uh, once we realize, you know, uh, it can propagate as waves and it can accumulate phase as it propagates, we said, okay, two light waves can meet with each other and uh, then you could have things like constructive and destructive interference. So uh, we looked at the example of uh, Young's double slit experiment uh, through which we said, okay, uh, when, when two uh, wavelets are generated, secondary wavelets generated through the slits, uh, which are comp uh, size comparable to the wavelength of light, then uh, they could interfere in the far field, uh, providing, uh, you know, bright uh, fringes at some points and dark fringes and some, some other points and so on. And uh, you had the opportunity to work on this um, last week, you, you did a hands-on experiment or uh, some of you uh, following this online, you saw a demo uh, corresponding to this uh, where you could see diffraction patterns and interference patterns uh, from a single slit and, and a double slit and etc. Right. So what we are going to go towards this week is uh, understand interference in a, uh, in a deeper sense, okay. We are going to first of all extend our discussion from a double slit to multiple slits and uh, see what is the effect of that. We will of course uh, look at what is the practical example of a multiple slit type of interference and uh, then extend whatever we have learned there to multiple configurations. So we said, okay, to produce interference, it could be as simple as a doubles, uh, Young's double slit experiment, but um, there could be more specialized configurations and there could be more specialized uh, functionalities that you could realize out of these configurations. So we could, we could we'll go on to look at specific configurations that can produce interference and uh, then we will go on to look at the coherence property of light. Okay, so that's what's coming up in the next couple of lectures. So first of all, let's look at this case where uh, you have, we are extending this from a Young's double slit to multiple slits. So you have multiple slits over here, right? And, uh, and once again, we have, a, a, let's say, a plane wave that's incident on this uh, slits. And we are interested in figuring out, if you observe it in the far field, so this is the observation plane, We want to know um, how is this light beam going to look when we observe it over here, okay. So we want to know whether the locations of uh, constructive and destructive interference is going to be the same and also, you know, uh, one of the examples that we were uh, looking at uh, in last week was uh, the specific example of how to discriminate different colors, right? We said the, uh, as you go to higher and higher order of uh, interference, 
you start separating out the colors more and more because the interference phenomena is a color dependent phenomena. So you can separate out uh, multiple colors uh, through this. Now, what happens to that property when you have multiple slits involved? Okay, so that's that's what we are interested in uh, looking at. Um, to do that, let's say uh, we have we are considering m as the number of uh, slits. Okay. And uh, let's consider that phi is the phase difference, right, at the observation uh, plane um, from successive slits. So you, you know that there are going to be each of those slits are going to produce a secondary wavelet and uh, from successive wavelets, let us say the, uh, the, the phase difference between uh, you know, uh, wavelets from successive uh, uh, slits uh, is, is phi. Okay. Then uh, if you look at any of this um, fields over here, U M, okay. Any of any of those uh, uh, waves coming from uh, one of these slits, U M can be written as, let's say, the intensity of each of those wavelets is I naught. So the amplitude corresponds to root of I naught. So root of I naught into exponential of um, J into m minus 1 phi is it, it would describe each one of those where m corresponds to you know it can take values of 1 2 all the way up to capital m capital m is the total number of uh, slits that we are considering okay this is uh, small m over here and th that's the index and uh, that index can take values of uh, 1 to m. Okay. Uh, so, so, what we are saying is that uh, if you take one of these slits as the reference that has uh, uh, let us say a phase of 0, then the next one from would, would have accumulated a phase of phi, the, the uh, next wavelet would have accumulated a phase of 2 pi, 2 phi and so on. Right? So, if I am looking at the total, yes, there is a question. So, we are coming to that. We, this is, so the question is whether um, we would have to sum over multiple waves. Um, so, what I am describing is uh, a single wave component. Uh, the component that we have from a single slit. Okay. Now, what we are going to do as somebody uh, just pointed out is to look at the total wave that reaches the observation plane that is going to be summation of all these wavelets. Right? So, that is what we are coming to and so we can um, write the uh, total wave amplitude the, the complex uh, uh, wave amplitude as u equals to root of i naught plus 1 plus h plus h square up to h to the power of capital m minus 1 provided um, where h is nothing but e power j phi. Okay. So, we are uh, considering that each of those wavelets has an equal intensity that corresponds to I naught, right? uh, but they have different phase 
okay so that's why we we wrote them as 1 plus so you'd have write, written them as 1 plus e power j phi plus e power j 2 phi and so on right so we uh, you know uh, substituted e power j phi with h for simplicity and and then we have this expression now if you simplify this you are getting an expression which is 1 minus h to the power of m divided by 1 minus h okay that's that's just a series of, uh, whose simplification would would yield this term and now i can go back and uh, substitute what h means so this is root of i naught multiplied by 1 minus e power j m phi divided by 1 minus e power j phi correct now what we are interested in is the total intensity that's what we are observing at that observation plane so the total intensity i is what it's magnitude of u square so and if i do a magnitude of u square that i not term will fall off okay and what i'll be left with is uh, 1 minus e power j m phi divided by 1 minus e power j phi magnitude of that the whole square right so i'm going to do a small trick over here um, so what i will do is i will take a e power j m phi by 2 outside from the numerator as a common term and similarly i will take a term e power j phi by 2 as a common term in the denominator so then what i will have is e power minus j m phi by 2 minus e power j m phi by 2 divided by e power minus j phi by 2 minus e power j phi by 2 and i would have a e power j m phi by 2 term outside in the numerator and a e power j phi by 2 term in the denominator but when i am taking a magnitude of that that will be 1 so i can just write this as i naught of this right so if i then expand these two uh, uh, terms in terms of sine and cos so what i'm going to get finally is i naught sin square m phi by 2 divided by sin square of phi by 2 so that is my total intensity okay so this is the intensity that i am going to see in the observation plane that is in the far field okay so now let's go ahead and uh, plot this function and try to get some physical uh, idea of what this represents okay so let me plot i as a function of phi so what is phi here phi here is the represents the phase difference between successive you know slits you know the, the wavelets are uh, uh, created by successive slits so i can uh, plot this as 2 pi 4 pi 6 pi 
and so on, right? So you'll clearly this function will peak whenever we have this this two pi, four pi, six pi, and so on. So the overall the uh, wave function is going to look like this. Okay, so it's going to actually take a peak value which is going to correspond to let's say the average intensity value is i bar, this peak will correspond to m times i bar, right? So that is going to be the uh, peak intensity of these, uh, uh, of, of the combined, uh, uh, you know, wave pattern that we are going to see. So essentially, light is getting scooped out of certain areas and collected in certain other areas, right? So we have constructive interference and destructive interference is happening over here. And uh, one interesting aspect, well, of course, uh, one thing to say is that between two of these peaks, you know, uh, you have uh, two pi, uh, as as the uh, phase difference, so um, so you, you would you would uh, you know you'll have to accumulate two pi to, to get from one peak to another peak. But uh, the thing of interest to us is uh, this point where it goes to the first minimum. Okay. If you look at where it goes to the first minimum, why is that of interest to us? Because that first minimum defines the width over which you have maximum intensity, right? So if you look at that where, so if you equate this to uh, zero, the total intensity to zero, and uh, you try to figure out what is the value of phi uh, where, where this is uh, 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 going to zero, you will find that that happens when um, m phi by 2 equals to uh, pi and, uh, and in other words, m is or, or phi, phi min, min, minimum is what I should say. Phi uh, minimum would correspond to two pi over m. Okay, two pi over m is where that that first minima happens. So what does that tell you? If I have just two slits, where would the first minima ha happen? Pi, right? So uh, in fact, if I were to use a different color and, and show you how the two slit interference would have, uh, what the two slit interference would have yielded, um, so I'm just going to normalize and show it. Uh, the intensity would have been much lesser or maybe I can, I can show it in that way. Um, so the maximum would have happened here, the same location, but at pi phase shift, it would have gone to a minimum and then maximum, minimum, maximum, minimum and so on, right? So this would have been for the two slit case, okay? And going to more number of slits, what have we done is the width over which that constructive interference happens is much more narrower, okay? Now, what is the uh, 
effect of this you know when when we uh, bring this uh, discussion that we had last week if if we bring that into perspective what were we talking about what can we on friday uh, what were we talking about uh, we said we could uh, get color selection right we could get color selection um using this interferometer right and that color selection uh, for each of those colors it would have been slightly shifted over here so we were saying okay if you want to discriminate between one color and another color you put a very small slit that corresponds to the maximum of the color that you are uh, wanting to pick out and then you can you can pick that out but there is always the neighboring color also some part of that coming through the slit now you say no no in my application i cannot have that i want to pick one particular color one particular shade of a color very precisely okay and i don't want any interference from any neighboring shades okay then what this tells you is you go for a multiple component interference so more number of sources that are interfering the resolution with which you are picking up a particular color is going to be much higher okay so or in general i'll just write this out because it's an important uh, aspect to keep in mind more number of interfering sources you have a narrower spectral selectivity or finer spectral selectivity you can get more number of interfering sources more constrained that interference condition okay and hence you know even if you are off by a, a a fraction of a nanometer in terms of the wavelength of light you drop off you know from the peak very rapidly so you can can resolve different colors with with with, with very high uh, precision i'm saying colors but you can think of it in terms of uh, spatial quantities as well so it it becomes very fine uh, uh you know you can pick up things with very fine resolution when you have multiple um slits participating in your interference process okay there is actually a different way of viewing this and uh that is actually uh, you know if you go back and and we uh, you know in a in our previous discussion we said we can represent each of these waves as phasers and that's the representation we have used here in all these calculations but let's look at it from a phasor perspective so this is a real and imaginary parts so this is a complex plane in which you are representing these phasors when you are considering two waves that are interfering you say okay there is one wave which has phi 1 as the phase and then there is another wave which has phi 2 as its phase that's both those things are adding together to the point that when we look at the overall uh, uh, you know uh, or or uh, what is the uh, angle with respect to the first wave that would be phi which is given by phi 2 minus phi 1 that's the phase difference right and then of course you can say okay the resultant phasor is like this and in this case you can represent constructive interference as the condition where what happens phi phi 2 and phi 1 are the same 
or integral multiple of 2 pi. Integral multiple of 2 pi would just be one rotation in this uh, phasor in this complex plane and it would have come at the same point. And if, if phi 2 is equal to phi 1, then you have constructive interference which means that both these phases are adding and that is giving you the largest resultant phasor. On the other hand, if phi is actually um, you know phi 2 minus phi 1 is equal to pi, it would have pointed exactly in the, the blue phasor would have pointed exactly in the opposite direction as the red phasor. If both of them have the same magnitude, then you are looking at 0 as the resultant, right? That's, that corresponds to destructive interference. So, in a phasor notation, you can see how constructive and destructive interference is, is looking like. And we, if we extend this to this multiple sources that are interfering, then you say each one of them is going to be slightly off from the previous one, right? Each one of them is going to have an angle phi with respect to the previous one, right? And when all of them add, you get a resultant phasor like this. But in this case, even for a very small change in phi, the result is going to be drastically changed, right? So, if phi is 0 or 2 pi or so on, then all of them are going to line up. So, you are going to get one large phasor. Okay? But the moment you have a small change in phi, it is all going to uh, you know, uh, wrap around, wrap around to the point that it can, it can make all the way back over here for a certain value of phi. And, and that value we found is 2 pi over m, right, where m is the number of interfering sources. So, the resultant that green would have been right at 0. If, you, if phi is 2 pi over m, okay. So, since we have multiple sources adding, the interference criteria is that much more constrained and, and that much more sensitive, okay. Now, uh, of course, you can see practical examples of that. So, what do I have here? CD and what do you see? As I move this, you can see all these different colors separating out. So, what is this due to? Exactly the same thing that we are talking about. Where, what are the multiple slits in this case? All the different tracks that have been written in this CD, right? All these tracks are essentially like notches and essentially like slits, except that these are all reflecting. The back plane is, is reflecting. Right? So, it is a reflective configuration, but you have all these multiple things that are interfering together and they are producing all this, they are separating out the colors very nicely. You can see all the colors, you know, corresponding to the white light, okay. So, it is very good for, uh, uh, you know, discriminating between the different colors. Very simple spectrometer you can build with this, right. And, uh, as we go along, we will see more and more examples of this, but, but the key point to note is more number of interfering sources, more constrained is your interference condition and hence better the selectivity when it comes to if you are, if you are trying to select different uh, one color from different colors, okay. You, you are getting a very um, narrow band filter or filter with a very high Q as they say in electronic electric circuits, uh, high Q circuits, right? You can build high Q circuits when you have more number of interfering sources, okay? So, what are these 
So is this the only interference configuration uh, that you can possibly have? Um, and you know, it turns out that's not that's not true. You have so many different configurations that are possible. Uh, uh, you know, uh, where, where where this interference uh, criteria can be uh, realized. And uh, when we so let's just spend a, a few minutes talking about that. So when we talk about interferometers. There are basically two classes of interferometers. One is called uh, uh, common path interferometer, and another is called a differential path interferometer. Okay. So, common examples for differential path interferometers are. Uh, one configuration which is called a Max Zender interferometer, another configuration which is called a Michelson interferometer. A Michelson interferometer is something that you are going to be building yourself this week and, and, and for those of you online you will be shown a demo of how the Michelson interferometer is constructed. Um, but but you will look into that a little more detail uh, later on this week. Uh, when it comes to common path interferometers, one of the um, uh, most popular common path interferometer is what is called a Sanyak interferometer, and uh, another one that can be uh, put in this category is is a Fabry Perot interferometer. Okay, so. Uh, a Fabry Perot interferometer is probably the simplest that you can think of. Um, it just consists of uh, two mirrors, right, that are uh, held uh, parallel to each other. Let us say they, they, uh, these are like uh, plane mirrors that are uh, held parallel uh, with respect to each other. And uh, of course, uh, what is the interference that we are talking about? What we are talking about is light that goes into this, it uh, goes this way, takes a bounce, goes this way and that takes a bounce and goes this way and so on. It just goes back and forth. So what are the sources, what are the multiple uh, interfering sources? It will correspond to say this is U0, U1. U2 and so on. So you can have multiple bounces and all of these are coming to this, uh, to this other mirror where you can, you can actually uh, have an interference between all those, all those waves. Okay. So that is what you are typically looking at as far as a Fabry Perot interferometer. And in, in, in this case, it is easy to uh, analyze what is happening in the structure. Where when you look at uh, delta phi, delta phi corresponds to the phase difference between two uh, successive bounces, uh, the two successive uh, uh, waves uh, is, is going to be given by 2 pi over lambda multiplied by n. If you say this, this medium in between is characterized with a refractive index n. And uh, let us say the thickness between the two mirrors or the, the space between the two mirrors is D. So you have N multiplied by 2D, right, is the phase difference between successive bounces. And uh, if this has got to be, so for, for constructive interference at this point, you will have this uh, uh, outgoing uh, wave. So, for constructive interference to happen, this has to be equal to integral multiple of 2 pi. That is that's what we have been looking at. And uh, let us say uh, n equal to 1, let us say this, this uh, uh, mirror pair is actually uh, just having air in between. Um, if n equals to 1, then 
that just gives the simple thing that d is going to be an integral multiple of lambda over 2, right. So, if you have an integral multiple of lambda over 2 as um, the spacing between the two mirrors, then you can have constructive interference and light will uh, go out in the other, other side of that uh, uh, fabry perot interferometer, okay. So, here again we see um, it is uh, dependent on wavelength, okay. So, you could potentially have um, you know only one wavelength uh, go through and some of the other wavelengths are, are uh, you know are not allowed to go through that interferometer. Um, and of course, uh, if we are talking about spectral selectivity, what do you need to have here? If you want to have high spectral selectivity, more number of things. So, what enables more number of interfering components here in this configuration? There should be very low loss. So, the two mirrors would have to be very highly reflective, high quality mirrors that does not distort the wave. There is nothing, there is no uh, dust particles or any other uh, scattering components inside the cavity. So, if you have a very what is called a high finesse cavity, then that corresponds to more number of waves that are supported inside the cavity and hence much higher spectral selectivity. So, if you are trying to build a filter, very narrow band filter using a Fabry Perot interferometer configuration, you will make the mirrors highly reflective, okay, and make sure that the losses within that etalon is what is called that, that cavity, the losses within that cavity is very, very low. Actually, that is an interesting point. If you have loss, how would this look like? So, it will turn around like this, but each of these arrows will be smaller and smaller upon successive bounces it becomes smaller and smaller. So, uh, you know your interference criteria may not be complete, the, when you talk about destructive interference it may not be uh, complete in that case, okay. So, that is uh, uh, Fabry Perot. Now, let us look at one more configuration and uh, let us let us look at what a Sanya configuration is about. Sanya configuration essentially consists of a, a wave that is incident on a partially reflecting mirror. So, this would typically be like a 50 50 split, okay. So, 50 percent of the light goes this way, and the other 50 percent goes this way. And uh, here you put a mirror, here also you put a mirror at 45 degrees, so that it comes here and here you put another mirror, so it retraces the path, right. Let me um, use a slightly different color to denote this one. So, in the other direction it goes like this, like this and comes back here, okay. So, if you are looking at the net output in, in, in this direction, you have interference between what and what? You have one wave that is going in the clockwise direction around this uh, series of mirrors and the other wave which is going in the anti-clockwise direction, okay. And both of them, some part of them go this way also towards the source, but if you look at the other part that is coming this way, that is going to have uh, an interference component which is dependent on the uh, phi of clockwise, anti-clockwise, 
right? So, the, 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 depending on the phase difference. And the interesting aspect about this is, since they are a common path interferometer, they share the same path. So, there is essentially no phase difference normally, unless there is one condition. What is that condition? Unless you rotate this entire apparatus, okay. So, if you, if you rotate that entire apparatus, then one path becomes shorter compared to the other path and then corresponding to that there will be a difference in the phase between the two waves, okay. So, you may, you may have uh, some, some of the light going this way because that, that corresponds to the rotation, okay, because they, they are uh, seeing slightly different phase shifts, okay. So, Sanyak uh, inherently is sensitive only to rotation, okay. Any other external perturbations do not uh, make a difference. There is a question in the back. So, uh, the question is, so the optical path length, is that the same in this case? So, what we are doing is, you know, we are saying, okay, uh, both of them are interfering at this 50-50 interferometer, but by changing the position, suddenly you are changing where, where that 50-50 interference happens, I mean, where that, uh, where that is located, okay. So, effectively, if you, if you uh, go in the clockwise direction, the counterclockwise beam will reach that 50-50 splitter first compared to the clockwise beam. For the clockwise, it is actually a slightly longer path. Okay, so it is actually more easily um, realized in a fiber form where you take a, a optical fiber and you loop it around and, uh, uh, and, and you, you, the 50-50 splitter is actually a fiber optic coupler and so on. That is the typical uh, uh, realization that you have. Uh, this is what is called, uh, this principle is what, what, what you call as a gyroscope. A gyroscope is something that measures rotation. So, it is most easily uh, realized in, in a fiber form, but nevertheless the point is that where it interferes, that is shifted within the time of propagation of the light, right. With respect to, it takes a finite time for the light that to propagate. So, within that propagation time, it is shifted ever so lightly and that causes a phase shift between the clockwise and the counterclockwise beams, okay. Um, any other questions? So, let us now jump to the differential path interferometer and see how things work here. So, in a differential path interferometer, um, you have this incoming beam which I will denote in red and uh, what you, what it encounters is once again a 50-50 splitter and this 50 percent goes through a path consisting of two mirrors and then it comes to another 50-50 splitter. So, what happens is one part of the beam goes this way, the other part goes this way and both of those interfere, right. You need not just interfere in this direction, it can interfere in this direction also, but what it um, corresponds to is actually a relative phase shift between, so this is the phase accumulated if this is phi 1, this is phi 2, because they are going through physically different paths, the phase shift that it accumulates during the propagation is different and then you have um, phi 2 minus phi 1, you know, causing a change in the interference. The interesting part here is, if it is constructive interference in this arm, it corresponds to destructive interference in this arm or in other words, 
If it's destructive interference, that is, light is missing over here, okay, um, you will see that it actually, uh, you know, appears over here, okay. Why that is so, I'm not explaining at this point, but maybe we'll, we'll come back and look at that. But uh, basically, the, the Maxenter interferometer has two different paths through which light, light can propagate. And uh, depending on the phase difference uh, between those two paths, you have constructive or destructive interference and you observe in one of the ports, okay. Um, Clearly, this can be used to uh, see if there are uh, any small changes in the path length. Suppose you uh, move the distance between the mirrors, right? Even if you uh, move from um, move by a fraction of a lambda, you will see a sudden change in the uh, intensity at the output. Okay, so it's very sensitive to changes in the relative path lengths and very sensitive to changes in the uh, refractive index of the medium in the two paths. So suppose you want to uh, 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 find the refractive index of some unknown material, you can put that unknown material over here and based on that you can change the constructive or destructive uh, interference criteria and, and, and based on that you can actually find out what is the refractive index of the medium. Uh, we'll go into a little more detail uh, later on the week when we uh, look at that Michelson interferometer uh, experiment or demonstration, uh, but, but those sort of things are possible. Precise measurements of distance, pressure measurement of refractive index uh, is possible with, with this Max Center. Now, the Michelson configuration is, uh, uh, is similar to the Maxender, uh, except, uh, you know, it's similar in the sense that it has a 50-50 splitter. But in this case, what happens is, uh, you put a mirror that reflects straight back. And similarly, in this arm, you put another mirror that's reflecting straight back. So, um, if this is my incoming beam, 50% of it goes this way and it's reflected back. Similarly, the other 50% goes this way and it's reflected back. And if you observe this, you have a differential phase shift. Let's, let's call this phi 1 and let's call this phi 2. And depending upon phi 2 minus phi 1, you can have constructive or destructive interference. So let's just uh, write it out. Um, let's say this has uh, D1 as the distance between uh, your beam splitter and the mirror. And similarly, D2 is the distance between the beam splitter and, and this, this other mirror. Then uh, phi 2 minus phi 1 can be written as 2 pi over lambda N2 D2. Let's say N2 is the refractive index of this medium and N1 is the refractive index of, uh, of this other medium. So 2 pi over lambda N2 D2 minus 2 pi over lambda N1 D1, okay. So, so this is 2 pi over lambda N2 D2 minus N1 D1, which uh, is known as the optical path length difference. The physical path length difference is just D2 minus D1, right? But the optical path length difference is um, refractive index multiplied by the distance. And of course, I'm missing a factor of 2 over here because D1 is actually the single pass. It goes and comes back. So there should be a factor of 2 in all of this. So that factor gets carried over here, right? So clearly you get uh, uh, constructive interference So when uh, 
phi 2 min, minus phi 1 is 2 pi m and that you can equate against this other expression over here and uh, if we say if n 1 equal to n 2 equal to 1 meaning this entire setup is, is constructed in air then uh, you get the condition that uh, d1 minus d2 should be equal to m lambda over 2. So, the uh, physical path length difference has to be um, m lambda over 2 for uh, constructive interference and, uh, uh, and of course, you can also uh, work out the corresponding uh, you know uh, uh, expression for destructive interference okay and this is fairly simple to uh, observe um, you know to simple to construct and observe so we will uh, do this as a hands on experiment later in the week okay thank you